lecture three because there were a few things that didn't work out. So here's the recording. Um, if you guys remember, I uh, started with uh, scroll view. There were a few things that I didn't actually end up showing because the emulator wasn't working. So for starters, we'll go through scroll view. So what is what exactly is a scroll view? Scroll view is a layout container for a view hierarchy that can be scrolled by the user, allowing it to be larger than a physical display. A scroll view is a frame layout, meaning you should place only one child in it, containing the entire uh, contents to scroll. The child itself may be a layout to the complex hierarchy of objects, and linear layout is often used with a scroll view. In English, it's basically just a, a frame layout, which only usually has one child, but that frame layout can span larger than the, the screen. Uh, and actually a lot of websites do this. So this, for example, would be some kind of scroll view because the content here is way bigger than what can fit on the screen. Um, so yeah. A scroll view only scrolls vertically. You need to use a horizontal scroll view to scroll horizontally. You should never use a scroll view with a list view inside or anything inside that can scroll uh, in the same direction because uh, then it becomes confusing for the system who takes this scroll is it the list or is it the scroll view which one of them is the scroll and yeah so scroll view so yeah I'll, I'll give a few examples right now so let's go here let's create a new project do this quickly lecture 3 Actually, I may have already created this project, so I'm going to and redo it. Uh, sorry about that, guys. There we go. And of course, it extends activity. All right, so now we have our activity. Let's quickly do on create and set content view to art of layout t underscore scroll view and create a new XML file. The scroll view inside. All of them. Oh, that text. It actually filled it in for me. In my case, I'm actually not gonna have all of this. I'm just gonna make it a scroll view. Let's get rid of this text here. I guess it remembered that I already done this. So now I have a scroll view. This is what you would see. Um, the scroll view is size itself is match parent. It spans the entire screen. Just like over here, this spans that much size, or maybe the entire screen if you want to look at it that way. But the contents are what are bigger than it. So inside, I have a text view whose uh, height, whoops. Is wrap content whose width is match parent. And then the text, I'll use what's usually used in cases like this lorem ipsum. It's just garbled text that doesn't actually meant to make sense, but a lot of people use in development just to fill up spaces. So I just put that in the text view. Of course, this looks nowhere near clean, but it works. Um, so we created the activity, we created the layout file. I need to import the R. That's done. It's quickly declared in the manifest. C 
see that you have the output. Scroll view. Scroll activity. I mean, that's what I called it. We have an intent filter. We have a category. Launcher. We have our action. Main. And that should work. So let's go to the emulator. There we go. So there we go. This is a text and this is a scroll view. And it works like a charm. Now let's see what happens if I remove the scroll view. So let's go here. Remove container. It comes just a text view. If we rerun it, this is what happens. You can see the text is just chopped off at the bottom. So it just becomes text view and you can't scroll it. Even though it spans higher than the screen, you can't scroll it. So if you put that back and rerun, you'll see that we can scroll now. So that's the basic idea of a scroll view. It's whenever you have static elements inside of it that need that span more than the screen, or may span more than the screen. Sometimes it doesn't span more than the screen, and in that case, it just won't scroll. Uh, however, if you rotate, so actually let me try to see if I can demonstrate that. So let's put like, only that much text. I don't know if that's enough. That is not enough. So that is not enough to scroll here. But if it was more, let's say, okay, I'll try to get it up to there. Just barely. Let's take out a little bit more. Alright, so there. Here it won't scroll because it, it's the screen is big enough to uh, show all the text. However, if I rotate, it's not. So there, it can scroll now. So it is dynamic. It'll figure out when it needs to scroll, when it doesn't. Alright, so that's the basic idea of a scroll view. Remember, don't put a list view inside of a scroll view. What's inside the scroll view usually is only one element. In this case, it's only a text view. But this works fine. However, I've had multiple of them. I would need to use some kind of layout. I would need to put in a linear layout or maybe a, a relative layout. Here, we can actually just do a quick example. Rapid container. I'll make it a linear layout. A vertical linear layout. Um, give an ID. I don't really care about the ID, so I erased it. So now I have a text view, but now I can have two of it, since there's two linear layouts. And then to differentiate between them, what we can do is make this one have a text color of red. Android color red. No, no red? Fine, we'll make it orange. It doesn't like that. Here, this is red. RGB, right? That's how they work usually. So F00 means red full, and the rest is not. I just auto formatted there. Let's see what happens now. There. So there, you have two text views right on top of each other. Alright, so my next example is. Uh, the last item that's necessary for UI, which I have not gone through yet, which is starting an activity from another activity. So I'll leave this untouched and let's go create new stuff. I'm going to create a new activity. Um, main activity, I'll just call it. I will be sending you all of this code, of course. So in onCreate, um, I'm just going to create a text view. Actually, I'll make it use the same resource. Uh, actually, no, I'll give it its own text view.
first activity. All right, and then set content view to text. And then in the manifest, we just quickly have to declare that one to be the starting one. CA.UFD dev dot uh, start activity dot main activity. I don't have to declare the, the scroll view activity anymore because I'm not going to be using it. So we have this, that should work. First activity, alright, cool. So now, what I want to do is I want to start a new activity here. So I will say intent. So to, st to start an activity, actually, I'll go to the slides here and explain there. Um, to start a new activity, you can start it with something called a start activity, uh, or the method called start activity, and you, you pass in an intent. Um, an intent is what is used to communicate with other elements that aren't directly within your reach using it in Android. So for example, I can't create an activity object myself because an activity needs to be drawn and there's a life cycle associated with it and a whole bunch of stuff. So uh, the Android system needs to start the activity, not me. And the way I tell the Android system to start the activity is using start the me start activity method and it usually uses communication, it allows communication to happen through objects called intents. So I'll create an intent intent equals new intent and there's two things you need to pass in the activity that's starting the new one because it needs to know who started it this in this case it's this I know who I'm starting and the and the definition of the class of the activity I want to start right now it doesn't exist I'll just call it second activity dot class and then I will say start activity that one with intent missing imports and then let's create this class cool and did all of that for me so let's quickly do another sample here Second activity. Set content view to TV. All right, and then we have to declare this one in the manifest. Activity. Oh, I can't do it inside the activity. I have another activity, and this time I don't need an intent filter because this isn't starting up activity. I'm just declaring this activity because I have to. So the name is ca.ufdev.startActivity dot second activity. And theoretically that should work. Second activity. Now I'll try to rerun it and see if we can actually spot the first activity starting up before it starts up the second one. It flashed for a very short second, but anyway, it's what happened is it started off this activity, and the moment it finished creating and setting content, it immediately started the next one. So we didn't really get a chance to see it, to see the first one in action. But basically, what happens is when you start an activity from another activity, that the second activity stacks on top of it. So when I back out of the second activity, I'll go back to the first one. Now, one thing that I never showed you guys when I promised to show you is buttons. So how can we make this not always start immediately, only start it whenever you want it to? So for that, we'll use buttons. And uh, so we're going to have to get rid of this text view, and we're going to have to create a layout for it. Activity. That is not, that is the wrong resource file. Um, activity. Activity main, I'll call it. So what do I have here? I'm just going to put a button. There we go. I don't want anything inside that button, so I'll just end the element right there. So. The way a button works is it's essentially similar to text box, so you can just set text on it, and I'll say, click me. 
and then what will happen is when you click that button there's a method called onclick that you can specify so I will say whenever this button gets clicked please execute the method called on button click for example I can define whatever I want and once this gets clicked there uh, it will invocate uh, a method called on button click in its appropriate activity now this button was specified in this layout file which is a main activity so over here I have to define a public void on button click that takes in a view which tells you which view was clicked and then this method will execute whenever you click that button and then so over here what I will say is I'll take these two lines and put them in here so only when I click that button will I see that and if we run this okay so there's the button it's a huge button because it was match parent for some reason let's make it about content nope in case you were wondering, match parent and uh, fill parent are exactly the same thing, exactly the same behavior. Behavior is just that it used to be called fill parent, they called it match parent because uh, just deprecation and the name made more sense. So there's the button. And now when I click this, it'll take me to second activity. So that's one way of listening to clicks on a button. The other way I'll demonstrate quickly is by setting what we call a listener. So let's not do that anymore. Take these lines and put them back in here. So I need to find that button. For starters, I'll give it an ID. Let's call it... Well, there's only one of it, so I'll just call it button. Usually if you're actually writing an app, you'd give it a more specific name, but there's only one in this, so I'll just call it button. And always auto-format. The ID should be at the top. So over here, I will say find view by id r.id dot button so this will return the view and then button equals that it'll complain because of a cast because it, this returns a view but that one is a button so I have to cast it to be a button and then I will say button dot set on click listener so you can set an object that is an on, uh, that, will, that is a listener for clicks basically it just listens to clicks and I will say new on on click listener there's a semicolon missing here and so I'm seeing import yeah and so this is the method that will execute now once that button is clicked and we'll move that inside um, so one thing in Java you have to always be careful is this now refers to the on-click listener but I guess you would probably want this to refer to the main activity in this case so I would have to say main activity of this and that would work hallelujah alright now this as you may tell is kind of ugly and that semicolon is kind of weird to remember so one thing that people usually do is they just make the activity itself the listener so once I do that it's a complaint that I don't have on click defined I'll actually just copy it from here and then on click listener that I will set to the button is this activity and this of course now refers to the main activity and I'm missing a bracket and if I run that that should work just as well so those are the two basic ideas uh, ways you can set listeners one is through the button here by defining on click uh, it should be gone um, or using an on uh, or uh, an, on, an on click listener Usually you shouldn't you should never have both. I was surprised that it actually worked with me having both defined. So I'm guessing the on click listener here actually overrides that one. But so this is the basic idea. This is how you set up an on click listener. The other way, as I mentioned earlier, is with an on click here. And then you have a, a view passed in. In fact, you know what? We'll just create another one. We'll create both so I can give you the code with both of them. Wrap and container, linear layout. Ah, I can't type. Oh, that's just a. Uh, whoops, that shouldn't have been grid layout.
And as always, I don't need that ID right now. So I'll copy the button, I'll make two of it. So there, and this one will have an on click. Um, Oh, it doesn't it's complaining here because you have the same ID twice. So this one doesn't need an ID since it's gonna it has an object method. This is always because of the externalization of strings. I explained this before. Um so now oh let me show you what happens if you don't have the method defined. It'll crash. Kaboom. It'll say method not found or something. No such method exception. It doesn't it doesn't it couldn't find the method because it didn't define it. Public void on second button click view view and then and that should work there we go and that one works too so those are the two ways you can define on click listeners. You can actually set on click listeners to any view, not just a button. Even if it was just a text view, you can set it. Um, usually not recommended because text views don't look like they can be clicked, but you can set it to any view, even a list view. Uh, well, I highly, I highly don't recommend. Um, so this is how you start an activity from another activity. Now there's two ways you can start an activity if you saw in my lecture. You can just start an activity and let it be, the way we did right now, or you can ask it to return a result for you. The simplest example I can give you is whenever you have an app that starts an activity to obtain a result such as a camera um, or an image, basically. So, for example, on Facebook, when you say uh, get photo, or like you want to get uh, upload a new photo, it starts up your camera's, your phone's camera. Of course, Facebook didn't actually implement the camera on your phone, it just started the camera activity from the Android system. So there is one of the cases where it would start the activity for a specific result, which is it was expecting an, ima uh, an image back. Other examples include contacts and calls, and th there's many examples for this, but basically you can start an activity for a specific result. So let's go to our main activity, and one of these will actually start an activity for a result. So I'll do it for the second button click. So over here, instead of saying start activity, you'll say start activity for result. And then you can you have you pass in the intent and if you see right there, a request code. The request code is basically such that uh, you sometimes yeah, for example, so in the Facebook app, whenever you want to upload a new photo, you can choose a photo from your gallery or from the camera or I think there's other choices I can't think of on the top of my head, but you can get get them from many places. So what happens is your activity could be essentially starting activities for results and uh, starting different activities for results. So it's usually useful to keep track of which one I created for what purposes, and that's why you have the request code. So request codes are usually defined in terms of anything you really want. I'll say 20 for now, just number. It's an integer, and then what happens is it, this will start the activity and then when that activity finishes you will get its result back in a method called on activity result right there and the super doesn't actually do anything so the request code is what you set up now I might have a request code here different than the one there this is for me in main activity to be able to tell which request am I trying to handle Am I trying to get an image back from the gallery or am I trying to get it from Dropbox or the camera those will have different results uh, and different ways to interpret this data. So in, acti on a, in on activity result, the first thing I should check is the request code and the result code. The result code is usually just a result okay. If result code, this is what the, the activity returns in terms of did everything go okay or did not, did it not. Or maybe it could return a specific result code in terms of saying this specific error happened. It's just what the activity returned to you as a number, not the actual data. Um so result okay. It's a constant defined by the activity. So I will say if it's not okay, 
I will say return. There's nothing to do. If it's not okay, I don't want the result. Um, all right, so now that I know that the result is okay at this point, I want to actually handle the request. So if request code equals 20, I will need to actually handle it. So my in my case, I'm going to have it send back to me something in the intent called data. Uh, sorry, so I have it passed back to me just a, t a string, some text that I'll put in the button, for example, or something. So I will extract it from the data. So data dot get string extra, and usually there's a key because it can place multiple strings in this intent. This just carries information, right? So it'll give me a key in terms of this is the username or this is the password, and that will so the the key that I pass in here will be, for example, the username, and then the actual data it would it would return would be the actual uh, you know the string, the username. So for this purpose, we need the button here too. I can call find view by ID again, but I think it would be more beneficial to just save it. Create field. And then at this point, I already have the button. I will say button.setText. A bad type. Okay, so now when I get when I come back, so I, I will start the activity for the request code twenty, with the request code twenty, and then when it comes back, I'll handle that request code twenty and say, take that string it passed back to me, and then just set it into the button. So now we've handled the part of the the starting or an activity for result in main activity. Now I will show you how to handle it in second activity. So in second activity, now this activity does not actually know about this request code. In the lecture, I, th I said it did. Uh, I was mistaken. This request code is only for main activity. If you wanted it, if you wanted the second activity to actually know about it, you can pass it in. You can say set or put extra, and you can say request code, and the value is 20. So this is you telling the second activity by passing it in the intent that, hey, I've started you for the request code 20. Although you don't usually need to. Um, get string username, set extra username string. Okay. So now let's handle it on second activity. So now when I get started here, I'm, I, I could be started from two locations, either from here, which is just a normal start activity, or from here, which is I've been started for, activ uh, I've been started for a specific result. So what I will do here is I will come here and check. Now every activity is started from from an intent. Either you started it from an intent such as my example here, or it was started from an intent from the Android system. So there, all, there will always be an intent. This is how you just get that intent that started you. So I will say if the intent contains, I need an if there, if get intent that contains um, get extras. Oh. Get. Is it uh, get int extra? Yeah. Get int extra. Request code. Zero. So if that request code was equal to twenty, there's no sense calling there, of course. Um, this is getting the the int integer extra that I passed in here that was actually a bad example over here if you look I passed in an integer uh, this is the name of the extra is request code the value of that extra is 20 so I'm getting it here if that value is 20 and this is just a default value in case the extra wasn't actually placed so in this case here that extra isn't there and this would return 0 so if it was equal to 20, which means I was started from here, I will reply to this activity in for it to read you know, an activity result with data. I will need to place into this data that I return to main activity from second activity the string I want. So my username, I'll just put it as um, 
So let's say my username I'll say is Abraham. So that's what I want to return to uh, main activity in the case that I was started for a request. So how do I do that? Um, I will need to set the result back to my initial caller. So there's a method called set result that you have two of it. You have one that just returns the result code saying everything went okay if in case this activity does not actually need to return data in terms of just return a result that says okay or not okay. So this is when you would use that. For example, if you if it was for example the settings screen, you don't usually require the settings screen to return information to you. You just open the settings screen to change information and you want to make sure that the information was sent back. Or a better example might be Facebook or Twitter. You have an activity that's supposed to post stuff to Facebook or Twitter, but you want to make sure he's logged in. You'd start in some kind of login activity. And the only information that login activity would return is if it successfully uh, logged in or not. So result code is what I'm looking for here. So the result code I will return is result OK, as in everything went fine. And the data is going to have to be some kind of intent. So let's do that create an intent called data and import data dot put extra name is username that's what I'm expecting on this side and then the value will be username and I'm using some code. Alright and that that's that that should be it that should work so now if i start it from if i click the first button it's going to start the activity and just return normally which means it shouldn't actually change the text of the button there's the second activity and i go back it didn't change the text of the button um this button is find id by uh, find view by id for the button which is i believe the second button no, on the first one, because the, we set the listener, the listener to why that one, the ID is attached to the first one. So if you saw, I started from the top and went back, nothing changed. Or if I started from the second one, that's where it's going to actually start it for a result, and then this code will execute and it will return the data, and when we come back, the button's text should change, assuming everything works fine. So there's my second activity, when I go back, the first button's text has changed. So that's how you do. Uh, this is this demonstrate how this demonstrates how to pass information in. So this is how I pass information int into another activity, telling it I'm starting you and here's some information that you need. Um, this is uh, how you return it in general. Uh, an example of using this, for example, would be when you are in your Gmail app and you tap on an email, it'll open a new activity with that actual email with all the contents for that email but that email activity in general doesn't know which email to open it's the first activity that tells it I've been clicked I need you to start up uh, and here's the information you need to be able to obtain which email it is that they requested and it's always 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 good style to make these constants and then you don't want strings floating around in your code because if one of them became a typo, everything breaks. So that's what we usually do. Main activity dot request code. Uh, except it was private. Request code. And then Eclipse will usually. Oh, typo. Change visibility. So now it's public. And then for that one, the style usually says you have a class called uh, usually I have class public static class extras public static final. Actually, this should be final too. Final simply means that no one can add to this or extend it or inherit from it. String uh, username equals and then here you will say main activity dot extras dot user 
and then over here we'd use that just as well. So that, and that should work. That shouldn't break anything. Click me, we go here, we go back, nothing changes, we go here, and we come back, the text changes. If I do this again, the text will change again, but it won't change back if I hit that one, because it don't change it back manually. Okay, so that's my example for starting one activity from another. And I believe at this point I have finished all the UI. Yes, this is all of Android user interface. Um, I mean, I haven't of course gone through every single element there is in Android. There is much, much more, but these are all the basics and everything you need to know to start building your own apps or join our development team. Um, actually, one thing that I keep forgetting to mention is uh, this th th this series of lectures is meant to help you uh, you start the bootcamp, but you don't actually need this to start the bootcamp. The bootcamp is pretty simple. You can actually go through it yourself without doing any of this if you have some just general programming experience or knowledge, which many of you do already because you've taken courses. Um, this is just meant to give you guys a jump start and make it a little bit easier to start the bootcamp and finish it and join our development team. But this, uh, please don't think that the, it is necessary to watch the, the, these uh, lecture slides to actually complete the bootcamp. You can start it on whenever you want and ask me questions whenever you want. In fact, there are two people that have already uh, started the bootcamp. One has finished it and sent me it, and another ha is working on it right now. Um, okay, so this is it for activities. Um, so what comes next is a little bit of back end. We've done almost all of the front end, or a lot of the front end for, uh, of Android, but we haven't done any back end. So the back end involves, uh, or almost always involves, the internet, uh, or network, or rendering, or games, or things like that, where you're not really drawing things on screen, or you're not dealing with users, but you are getting content from Twitter, for example, in a boot camp, or you are parsing information or viewing a video or uh, like YouTube's app or getting emails all of that kind of stuff happens in the back end so uh, I will go through what is necessary for the bootcamp which is being able to connect to the internet being able to get information off of API's um, be able to parse that information safely and how to handle weird things that happen the first example I'll give on uh, what weird things that could happen are I'll show you the same issue that you people usually have with scroll views. Uh, UFTDev.scrollView.scrollViewActivity. I actually have mentioned this in class before, but I want to bring it up now because it's very important. Um, if I rerun this, I should see a different activity start up. This guy. So, if you can see, I'm, I have this activity running and I can rotate the phone, it'll work fine. Here's the thing, when you actually rotate, the Android system more or less panics and doesn't know what to do with your activity. Unless you specify otherwise, it will destroy your activity and reinstantiate it. A simple, simple proof I can give you is if it was actually just rotating things on the screen, it would maintain its scroll position. I am almost near the bottom. I want to leave a little bit of black there for us to see, but I'm very close to the bottom. When I rotate, watch what happens. I'm back at the very top. And the same happens otherwise. Here I'm actually at the bottom, you can see that. And then when I rotate, it comes back here. So it actually destroys the activity and restarts. Um, that's one thing you always have to keep in mind. If I specified that I want to handle that, I'll do this, I'll do orientation, and I'll do what screen size. And usually, by convention, we also add keyboard hidden. For those uh, phones with keyboard, Opening or closing the e keyboard will force uh, the screen to, or, uh, to change orientation, and that's also what would cause the same issue. Um, this pipe simply simply means uh, a combination. So I'm doing handling orientation and screen size and screen and keyboard hidden. So let's do that. Now, if I'm at the bottom and I rotate, it maintains its scroll position. It stayed at the bottom. If you saw that. So that's what happens when you don't specify config changes. For now, we won't. I'll leave it. And I erased the, that tag. Alright, so 
let's go to the slides back end so the first thing I'm gonna go through with back end is network calls um, everything on the network you works with something called a URI a uniform resource indicator basically it just tells you where to find some kind of resource uh, internet uses the internet uses URLs which are uniform resource locators which are things like that that well, apparently the text is too big to fit on the slide but uh, but stop messing around what happened there okay well anyway this is for example a URL that would give you the Android resources that we have uh, put up for you guys on UFD dev um, so that's a URL every URL is a URI but every not every URI is but not every URI is a URL. A URL is a subset of URIs. URIs can be used on the system. So, for example, when you open here, that's a URI, not necessarily a URL. Maybe, maybe not. It, it, it differentiates. But basically, that's the basic idea. You don't need to know the details of this word to work. Um, but that's the idea. So the problem with network calls is they have many considerations that you need to take into account. They take a lot of time and they're very, very unpredictable. They may never ever succeed sometimes if you enter an elevator and they require special permissions. Um, if you don't specify that your app specifically has the permission to use internet, it just won't work. I actually did forget this in the lecture and that's why my app wasn't working initially, then I remembered to add in the permission. Um, and some of them even require multiple steps. Sometimes when you, before you can send a tweet to Twitter or something, you need to authenticate. You need to make sure that your username and password are correct or whatever information or you, that your device or maybe your Windows is genuine. There's a lot of stuff that require multiple steps. So you need to authenticate and then request data. And this may take time. So the problem with this is, if you guys remember, in the very, very first lecture, I mentioned that everything happens on uh, everything unless you specify otherwise happen on, on the UI thread and there's only one of it there's only one UI thread on Android system and this is the thread that we're talking about the thread doing actual rendering and scrolling and everything this is the UI thread that is the main thread and if you do network calls on the UI thread it'll just wait for the network call to finish and the problem with that is it'll just block the UI thread while the network call is going the entire UI of the device is gone, so you can't even hit back, you can't even hit home, you can't do anything. You may be able to lock and unlock and maybe that will bring it back, but in general, um, if the UI thread is frozen, it's frozen. So in general, we can't really do networking on the UI thread because we can't afford to block it. Sometimes network goes really fast when you're dealing with, when you have a really fast connection or you're connected to Wi-Fi, usually it's almost instantaneous. but in the off chance he enters an elevator you don't want the phone freezing and so there's a big problem with that and what happens is Android usually doesn't even let you do that uh, and in most cases when you try to do network calls on uh, and by a network of course I mean internet whenever you try to do network calls on on the main thread it'll throw a network on main thread exception which means you can't do this it won't allow you um, so in conclusion we need to make them run on a different thread um, for those of you who don't know what exactly a thread is, um, a thread is a sequence of instructions. So basically when commands are being run on the CPU, they usually run in a sequence and that's what a thread is. Um, modern computers usually have a lot of threads running. So if I go here, I have 783 threads running on this computer right now. Usually it's a little bit less. Usually it's about 400, but I guess I just have a lot of programs running. So 755 threads running from 129 different processes. A process is basically something like this program. But this program may be asking for stuff from the internet and displaying the stuff so it could have many, many threads. Chrome usually has a lot of them. Can we see that? Google Chrome Renderer, Chrome, Chrome, Chrome Worker, Chrome, you can see a lot of Chromes. So, here yeah, actually, we can just order them. Chrome alone has this many threads. Actually, some of those even have more threads. Actually, sorry, these are processes. Chrome has that many processes, and each of them has up to like six threads. That one I even have 41 threads. So basically, it can have a lot of threads. And your CPU runs multiple threads simultaneously. That's what multi-core is. So that's what a thread is. We need to run, make them run a different thread, not the UI one, so it doesn't block it. Only one thing can be executing on one thread at one point. 
So let's take a URL, fetch its content, and just display it as it is. I just want to get something from the internet and just show it up for starters. And then we can get into the details of how to take that response, parse it, and make something useful out of it. So let's do something called the JSON parsing demo. So a JSON is, if we want to open Wikipedia, it's, it's short for JavaScript object notation. It's basically whenever you take an object, something like the activity, actually that was a bad example, I mean sorry, bad, bad window. So this activity has a string called request code, it has a button, actually that's static so it's not really, um, uh, static things are not attached to instances of the activity so it's not attached to this. However the button is. So we have a button, we have a bunch of methods, all of this kind of information goes in, a, in an object. So you can have much more, I can have another integer here, private int, and so on. You can have a lot of stuff. So what happens is, sometimes you need to communicate that object to someone else, and the most common, one of the most common ways to do that is you have JavaScript object notation. So a JSON is basically a, a, just a big string. Um, uh, yeah, here's a simple example it's a big string that just has text so the white space here actually doesn't mean anything those spaces and tabs don't actually mean anything they're just there to make it easier for you to read so this object has a variable called first name which is a string whose value is John this is the same as me saying button and then the actual button object so this is a variable called first name and its value is John last name Smith age it's an integer with a value 25 and then it has an object called an address that has all of this information inside of it so you can have nested objects if you can see and then inside the address object inside my top level object which doesn't really have a name um, there's postal code with a number and then you can have arrays so there's an array called phone number which has see those square brackets that denotes an array this denotes an object uh, comma just comma separates things, there's a list of stuff, a bunch of stuff inside. So this is an array, an array of objects of type this. There's two of that, one of them is home and fax, so these are phone number objects, or an array of phone number of objects, and this is what it generally looks like. So this is what a JSON looks like, and this is what you would need to parse to uh, display on the screen for tweets or something. Uh, usually this is what would return the tweets or tweets the, t the tweeter's name, the tweeter's content, and maybe the image, and all of that kind of stuff. Now, fortunately, there are many libraries that parse this for you and make it easier, so you don't actually have to go through the text and parse it, you just use it. But that's the basic idea. So let's just get one of these from online, not copy-paste it, I actually want to get it from the internet, and just displays, display it on the screen. So, I'm going to use, for my example, Reddit. Apparently, if you go to Reddit, and you just slap on a .json, it'll give you the JSON for that page. Now, of course, keep in mind this is Reddit, so it's probably going to be huge. This is the JSON. It's a big text block. And there are extensions. I have an extension here that allows me to look at uh, JSONs in a nice way. So this JSON, at the very top level, has two things inside of it. It has a kind called listing, a data, a data object that has a mod hash, a list of children, an after, a string called after, and then something here. We don't know what type it is because it's not. This is also a string. So we have two objects in this one, and then in the in the data object we have four. This is a list of children, and children is huge. So this is what the JSON looks like. I'm going to take that link and use it in my app to actually get data. Um, okay, so let's go to Eclipse. I don't know what I was doing there. I'm going to do another new activity, JSON parsing activity. UFT dev dot uh, JSON parsing. So I've created a new activity. All of this code will be given to you guys, of course. Actually, I'm just going to create a text to you. Um, 
no I will need it to scroll so I'm gonna have to because it's a lot of text I'm gonna actually make it in a scroll view uh, content view auto layout dot JSON activity dot JSON browser. these names of course aren't as specific I just picked that name for now if that doesn't exist yet so I'm actually gonna take it from the scroll view activity since it's very similar copy it and I'm gonna call it activity underscore JSON price so let's get rid of those give it an ID um, I'll just call it into JSON text and then over here I will say text view equals find text view find view by ID r dot ID dot JSON text and then imports and let's create that field so now I have my text here the next thing I need to do is actually you know get actually let me just declare this in the manifest first and this will be my starting activity right now ca.uftdev. Um, json parsing on I think that's what I called it. Let's just make sure that runs. I think I'm just gonna see a white screen if that runs properly. Perfect. So so we need to fire it off into a separate task uh, thread. So the easiest way to do that is create something called an async task. So a private class static class and JSON async extends async task. Actually, usually classes start with a capital. Extends async task. And these are the parameters and the progress and the result, which we won't really be using in our case. You can look them up to find out more details for them. But those are the arguments it would take. Let's add implemented methods. The only method you have to implement is do in background. And there's two other ones that are usually useful, which are on pre-execute. And then you have on post-execute. And super doesn't really do anything. So I don't believe you can, you can I believe you can remove it. If it doesn't work, we'll notice. Um, so, okay, so what do we do in the background? We need to create something called a URL object. URL, URL equals new. URL. And HTTP edit.com.json. Edit that is the URL. What's your problem? Oh. Many of these in, uh, network related stuff will throw many exceptions. So I'm doing a catch exception in general and print stack trace. So now that we have the URL, URL.get content will simply get the content. This is a blocking method. So if I had put this up there, it would block the UI until the content comes back. Um, if Android let me in the first place. So this will get me the content. Uh, what this will return, which actually I was mistaken about in their lecture, this will return an input stream. If uh, you don't know what an input stream is, it's basically similar to what you remember as standard I, standard in and standard out in uh, in C or C++, I guess. And C++ actually would be C out and C in. That's what you print to whenever you say printf. When you say printf, hello. What, this is the same as saying f printf stream. Uh, sorry. 
a what was it called? Uh, ice stream. I think I think that was it called. But basically, that's the stream uh, standard out. Sorry, it was. I believe this would be C out or standard out. And then hello, those are equivalent. So basically, whenever you print to the, just the default output, that's standard out. And standard in is whenever you reach from the default input, which would usually be case, uh, which would usually be the keyboard on the, the command prompt. Um, yep, you need to cast it as an input stream. Just to make sure, by default, this returns an input stream, or null of the content type if the result is unknown. Okay, so this would return an input stream. Now, this input stream I need to convert to a string. I honestly forgot how to do that and the result is always your you can always find it on Google convert input stream to string Java that is actually the same thing I used before so let's copy that include our inputs so this is so that input stream is my stream and my encoding would be I owe you tools. Oh. Oh actually yeah, this is the one I used. So let's just copy that method. Actually I can put it here since only there it's gonna be used. So now I can get the string out of it. String string text equals Convert stream there. So now this will have the text of that JSON. All I want to do right now is take that text and throw it into text view. So this is what usually you would do in the, on post ex, on post execute. So this method do in background happens in the background. On pre execute and on post execute happen before and after this but they happen on the UI thread. Uh, the reason that is important is because you can't manipulate a text view and change its uh, data and play with it if you're not on the UI thread. So you have to do it in on post execute. So what I will need to do is take that text, save it. So we'll do field text and then I will say in on post execute I will say main activity dot this dot it wasn't called main activity was it? it was json pressing activity dot this dot text view dot set text to text no including instance okay fair enough I need to actually pass in the activity. So I can't do this. Um, I'll pass in the text to you when this is created. So let's do this public JSON async. Text view. Private text. And then I can say tv.set text. Alright, cool. So our async task is done. I don't know what you're complaining about. It's never used. So let's actually create this async task because here I just defined the class, of course. Let's create this async task and use it. So new JSON, uh, JSON async, uh, async, I'll just call it. Well, new JSON async, I need to pass it in text view, which actually means I don't need it there anymore. I just made it full screen. Ah. Um, so this creates the async, but I didn't actually execute it. And then execute. Uh, I 
don't need to pass in any parameters because I've made them all void. Is ambiguous. Oh, I can just leave it empty. There we go. So, all right, cool. Let's see what's happening here. I'm creating the when once I create this activity and on create, I set the content to be that text view. I find the text view. I pass it on to the async task, and then I execute the async task. Now, this async task, async task, what we'll do is a non-free executor won't do anything, which means I can just remove that method. And and do on background. Um, I will create a new URL object, pass it the URL that I want to parse, I'll get the content which will return an input stream and then I'll convert that input stream to a string. That's some method I found online uh, that does that for us. And then I save that text here in the field. And then in on post execute I will set the text of that text view to be text. So let's do this over here. I'll say I don't know if we'll actually have time to see it, but I will say text before parsing it, before, yeah, before getting content. So we should see this for a very short time before the actual result comes in. So now when I run it, it's not going to work. Why? I don't have permission to use the internet. There we go. I don't know if you saw that, but it said permission denied. So now I need to go to the manifest and say I use permission internet 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 I might have missed it internet and then hopefully this should work ta-da there is that huge JSON so now we have the JSON result and that's pretty much it that's pretty much all I wanted to go through for today that's essentially all I went through for the previous lecture. I will do this demo again in lecture because I did this in the half or 20 minutes uh, that was past the hour and not many people stayed. So that is my simple demo for networks. I want to explain a little bit in terms of why this is bad. So what happens is, I'll relate it to the rotating thing again. Goodbye. So what happens is, let's say I execute this async task and it starts loading the data from the internet. But let's say it's a lot of data and it's going to take maybe 15 seconds to load it, which isn't actually out of this world. When you're loading images, that's totally plausible. So it's loading the data and then I rotate. What happens? You saw that. It started everything from scratch and it actually said it was loading. You can see it actually starts reloading every single time. For some reason it's faster than in portrait than in landscape, but yeah. So it destroys the activity and starts from scratch. When you start from scratch, it actually just executes everything from scratch. The problem with that is if I do this. Usually it'll crash if it wasn't able to get the result fast enough. Okay, I guess in this case it's not really happening. But what happens is if the async task is still executing, it's still executing in the background and I rotate it, the activity gets destroyed. When this finishes, over here, when it tries to set the text on the text view, but the activity got destroyed, this will usually cause a crash. Did it crash by any chance? No. But this will often cause a crash. And that's one big problem with asynchronous tasks. They need to be, in a way, synchronized with the activity. In terms of, if the activity is getting destroyed, the async task should stop, so that it doesn't come back with a result. One easy common way to do this is, and the activity is on destroyed. Uh, before the activity actually gets destroyed, you want you don't want to you don't want super to happen yet. Um, you will say async dot cancel and a false in here. I will need to make this a field. Um, yeah, so that's the basic idea. So this will cancel. This false is so that it, it, it interrupts, uh, so I can choose if it interrupts or not. If I say true, it will stop it in mid-execution. If I say false, it won't. Um, the problem with this is it's not very, very safe. Um, if you don't interrupt, 
if you don't say false, it'll just finish the method it's executing, which still could cause the crash. Because if it's in the middle of on post execute and activity getting is getting destroyed, it'll just keep going with what's happening here. So that's the problem with that one. Uh, that's the problem with the false. If the problem with the true is if it interrupts it, you could get into on post execute twice. If you are already in on post execute and it's executing and you interrupt it, it'll leave on post execute and come back into on post execute again with an error. So that's also not good. So the general idea is you want to generally avoid async tasks unless you're absolutely sure they're safe. Uh, the t some one common use for async task is something not in, uh, not associated with an activity. So something that you fire off in the background and you just want it to finish whenever. So checking for updates maybe, for example, if for an app, it'll just put it in the background and just leave it there. If it, whenever it, it'll not, it won't be tied to an activity. Whenever it finishes, it just updates the settings, for example, or something like that. So something not associated to an activity, that's fine. Otherwise, uh, what's commonly used is something called scheduled thread pool executor. Or sometimes it's just a scheduled executor. Uh, it won't let me execute. I'll explain what that is in one second. I just want to check if there is actually a scheduled executor. Scheduled thread pool executor. Um, th there are other executors. I don't remember what other ones there are, but there's a lot of them. And one, and this, this for example, will ask you to specify how many threads you want. So new scheduled thread, and then it'll specify a pool size. So when I say a pool size of one, this will basically create another thread for me that is will, that will stay there just waiting for me to give it instructions to run. The way it works is you pass in things called runnables. Was it post? Is it run? Is it add? There's usually execute. There you go. And then you pass in a new runnable. And a new runnable, a new, a runnable is basically just something that can be run. So in here I can say for int i equals zero print blah blah. It's just something that it's just code that you can run in general here. It's just anything you want. Um, executors are a little bit better because they're usually tied to the application. You can usually tie them to application and once your application is getting destroyed you can have it destroy it or at least this is uh, more predictable. We'll go into more details of it later but basically whenever you need things to be constantly happening for example when you're pol polling for images or something like that you can use the executor and the executor can always just since it's its own entity it's not an async task it just gets executed and just disappears after since it's its own entity that will stay there you can always have a check whenever the result comes back in in the runnable uh, that 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 runnable that was defined um, you can go like is my activity still there if it is i'll give it the result otherwise i'll just dismiss it and the executor will not have reference back to this activity while while uh, this guy usually does, while async tasks usually do, because they're defined as part of it, which means if you have uh, an async task, it usually refers to activity, and that's not really a good idea to have two things referring to each other. We'll go into more details of this memory leak and asynchronous stuff later, but that's the basic idea, and that's how you would just get something from the internet and display it online, uh, display it here. And hopefully, you can see that everything you can find on Google. All right. Um, thank you guys, and this is it for lecture three. I will be also re-recording lecture two at some point because I don't think that one's also too good.